All right, we shall resume our meeting. I wanted to give members sufficient time to see whether you have any issues relating to the policies and the principles in order that we can ensure there is procedural justice. So one more time, we ask whether members have any other questions. Apparently not. Ellen. I'm reading the paper which is tabled today. It's just been tabled today. It was tabled for us two or twenty minutes ago. Why the rush then, Chairman? For comments from for example the Law Society, they are they're they're quite important, yes. Why are we forced to read this document over a few minutes? Well, I allow members ten minutes uh for members to read this document. Well, I think uh, some members are. Uh, no, no. I'll give you ten more minutes. Well, if members think that there is no problem, fine. Well, I gave members ten minutes to go through this document, and questions were raised already. And I then gave members another five minutes to see whether or not they, you, you have other questions. I'm reading the Law Society's comment, so if I may ask a question, I, I'll do my best. The Law Society is asking this question. I think we ask about the the question of uh, professional uh, 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 legal privilege. Now, the existing safeguards, I understand, apply to all the all the agreements to be signed in the future. I'd like to know whether or not this response has been given to the Law Society yet, and has there been any response from the Law Society? Deputy Secretary, Mr. Leung, regarding the Law Society, when before we consulted the uh, Financial Services uh, Panel, we had conducted consultations, inviting different deputations, including the Law Society. Uh, we were not yet drafting the bill at that stage, and we were consulting the, the stakeholders as to whether or not we should uh, provide a statutory, uh, independent statutory framework for the purpose of the exchange of information. And the request put forward by the Law Society is very similar to what they have said in their recent uh, submission. They regard the protection to be very important. Under the legal provision, the protection uh, uh, applies to the CDPA. And they hope that such protections, for example, the question of professional legal privilege, uh, the, 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 the and <clears throat> the quest and the, the need the, uh, and the question of confidentiality and the protection of privacy, privacy of the taxpayers, the law society said in their submission that in future, under the framework for the EOI, these will be provided. We've also uh, looked into this with the DOJ. And we have now uh, included all these uh, legal protection, uh, and they will be extended to the legal framework for the exchange of information in future. Although different tax jurisdictions may offer different protection under the, the respective frameworks, but in Hong Kong, we insist that under the, the protection provided for under the CDTA, they will also be uh, they will also be uh, contained in the framework for the TIEAs in future. Secondly, the Law Society also thinks that the CT, CDTAs are. Uh, uh, helps uh, promote uh, helps Hong Kong uh, trade, uh, and they say that although we have the TIA framework, I think the policy focus should be that we should uh, promote the signing of CDTAs. Just now, one or two deputations may, made a similar point, such as the General Chamber of Commerce. I like to reiterate that in the bill this time there are two important points. That is under the CDTA framework, regarding the restrictions on the closure and the types of taxation, we've actually made certain enhancements, which we believe can help us uh, in future when we negotiate for CDTAs. We would be able to say to our trading partners that we are better able to satisfy the requirements and at the same time help us uh, at the policy level promote CDTAs and not TS. 
Secondly, the Bills Committee also uh, studied a paper regarding notification, uh, review, and uh, disclosure. And it is, and there is a schedule under the restrictions of disclosure. We have undertaken that in future, if we uh, work on the arrangements for for the tier arrangements, the what the requirements in the schedule will also apply to the future tier agreements. In other words, last time we talked about you know uh, notification review and the circumstances under which they can uh, propose amendments or ask the ILD not to make the disclosure. Such a review mechanism, uh, we will restrain ourselves so that uh, in future this arrangement will also be in the tier arrangement. Although the tier legal framework for ECD in most of jurisdictions they don't have such a detailed mechanism for notification. Thank you. Well, the what the deputy secretary explained. Uh, to me just now. Have you notified the Law Society uh, about your response and, uh, and is the Law Society satisfied with the response? Is that the current status? Regarding the bill, well, I made uh, I highlighted a few points just now. On the 2nd of May, we, re the, the, we received this uh, submission from the Law Society to the Bills Committee. Because on Friday we have collected all the written submissions, and that's why over the weekend we uh, we uh, uh, prepare this global response uh, by way of this table, which is uh, given to members now, and we're willing to uh, through your secretary or or we will ourselves uh, relay to the law society about our position and our response. Well, I don't want to delay things. If the chairman thinks it is appropriate, we can go for the cross by cross to scrutiny first. Later on, would not the the uh, the deputy secretary will approach the law society directly or approach the law society sh through our secretariat? Then we can deal with that uh, accordingly. I don't know whether this is the right approach. The secretariat can relay the response from the administration to the. Law Society. Law Society. However, should should we allow for some allow some time to see whether the Law Society has any response, Chairman? Well, this is a very short bill. If you really want to start the clause by clause, I believe we'll be able to finish our job today. In that case, we would have you know. Finish our scrutiny of the bill. If that's the case, and, ju and just in case, uh, if the law society has any further views, and uh, the government is also responding to some other uh, deputations, it's just that the law society is not present today. So I don't know what the procedure is. Can we resume the bills committee's meeting after it has wrapped up everything? Could the legal advisor uh, also help here? I've heard Mr. Alan Leung's view. That is, if the law society or the other professional bodies have uh, further views and strong views up upon receiving the response from the administration, then can we resume the meeting of this bills committee, which should have already, you know, uh, finished its uh, job? But uh, it, it happened in the past that uh, after the bills committee has finished with the scrutiny of the, of the bill and their further views from deputations, the bills committee will not convene any meeting for the time being, and then uh, the relevant responses will be emailed to members, and if need be, uh, a, a meeting could be reconvened. So the chairman will not say in the record that we finished the scrutiny of the bill. Except that we've uh, scrutinized uh, all the provisions, and we will say give the law society, uh, let's say, five days, and after, and we see whether they have any further comments. And if not, uh, the chairman can uh, circulate through email and officially uh, declare that this bill's committee has finished the scrutiny of this bill. Is that the case? Is that the case? 
Well, one could say, you could say that for the time being, we'll finish the scrutiny of the provisions in the bill, uh, pending whether there are any further views from deputations. If, uh, Mr. Allen Lau, we've actually scheduled one more day for this, for the meeting of this bill's committee, and that would be the 7th of June at 9 a.m. Well, there are only nine sections to the bill, and what I think we'll be able to finish the scrutiny of the bill very quickly. If within these few days, uh, if the, of course the bureau will need to ask the deputations whether they have any further views uh, upon receiving a response. If during the next few days we important we receive any important views, you can liaise with myself or the other members. Today, let's say we finish with the clause by clause, and if there are still important issues which warrant a new me meeting to be convened, and I will not rule out the, the option of convening another meeting on June 7th to discuss any outstanding issues, although formally uh, we might have gone through the entire bill today. Mr. Dennis, uh, do you have a question? I'm sorry. I have to attend a meeting next door just now. When I heard members' discussion about professional legal privilege, I also like to comment on this point. I don't know whether when you discuss the bill with the bar, associate, bar association and the law society, have you discussed the the, the potential case which uh, uh, which change the the law regarding professional legal privilege is five versus two uh, decision of the Privy Council in the UK. Well, the case, I think uh, the, the person is uh, involved, person who is an accountant and a lawyer, when that person gave a tax advice to the client, the question raised in court was whether or not such tax advice would be covered by professional legal privilege. The uh, Supreme Court in the UK ruled that it should not be included. So LPP was not included. But that case law has not been cited in Hong Kong, and we don't know what, uh, what the position will be in Hong Kong. So legal advice regard on tax matters, would that come under the scope of professional legal privilege? So if in the UK or other common jurisdictions uh, ask for su such information from Hong Kong, do we need to uh, provide such information if we believe that they are covered by professional legal privilege? But there might be ambiguities on this point. I may I assume that all of us have read the Prudential case on the question of legal professional uh, privilege. Although we are all providing tax advice, the uh, Privy Council uh, said it's a five to two decision. It says that the professional advice given by an accountant will not be included under the framework of professional legal privilege. Only the advice given by lawyers will be included. Mr. Court, I believe my, my, my interpretation is correct. So could the Bureau perhaps uh, or the commissioner also respond. Of course, I dare not, you know, uh, show off in front of the experts. Uh, uh, Mr. Clark might be uh, attending a different meeting just now. When I responded to a question from the chairman, I said that uh, in the model for the exchange of information, it is clearly stated that if certain information falls under the scope of professional legal privilege, then uh, the uh, the uh, common authorities has no obligation to exchange information. Under 51A4, 44A of the Inner Revenue Ordinance, it is stipulated that uh, uh, when uh, uh, it's about uh, disclosure by barristers and, and solicitors. Just now, the Commissioner also said that if pursuant to this uh, agreement and the provisions in the IRO, and under such arrangements, if they think that. Uh, if the information falls under the scope of LPP, then he has the right to not to provide such information. The other party has to respect our taxation authorities in relation to local legislation. Of course, every now and then, some courts may have cases 
related to LPP. Then, depending on the case concerned, we'll have to look into the details. But the legislative intent is very important. Anything covered by LPP will not be disclosed by the tax authorities. Oh, yes, I understand that, and I believe you won't disclose the information. As this amendment bill is introduced into the LegCo, we have to consider the possibility of changes in other jurisdictions. Our chairman works in a law firm. If in the capacity of an accountant, he provides advice to his client, would that be covered by the LPP? I mean the chairman as an accountant. Well, I think uh, throughout the whole of Hong Kong, you can only find a couple of persons like me. Under the common law, if there are such developments, will you adopt a very stringent approach to LPP or will you adopt a relaxed policy? For LPP, of course, we all think that a more relaxed approach is preferred. Mr. Chairman, let me supplement on this LPP issue. When the IRD collects information in the process, if LPP is involved, if the IRD is of the view that that's the right of the taxpayer, then we won't ask for the information. In our taxation agreements or agreements with other jurisdictions, there are provisions to the effect that in terms of EOI, we must not breach local laws. The chairman mentioned the concept of LPP, which is undergoing changes. When we enforce the law, when we exchange information with other jurisdictions, we have to observe the local laws. If we are to breach local laws, we won't exchange the information. For EOI, two types of LPP will be involved. One is LPP related to litigation. The other type is LPP related to advice, which will only involve statutory interpretation. If the legal professional provides an advice not in the capacity of a solicitor or a barrister, then that privilege may disappear. Of course, the IRD agrees that we have to handle each and every case very carefully. Mr. Dennis Kwok, any follow-up? Any more follow-up? Well, you said that uh, the privilege might disappear, but that's not absolute, right? If the advice is not provided by a solicitor or a barrister, then there may still be professional privilege. You admit that, right? You still give them LPP. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, the LPP concept is related to lawyers because we're talking about a legal term. In Hong Kong, only lawyers are entitled to give legal advice. Well, that's where the issue lies. In Hong Kong, in particular, for the large accountancy firms, very often they'll provide taxation advice to their clients. And legal provisions may be involved, although there are not uh, solicitors or barristers. So will they be covered by LPP? As I cited, the Court of Final Appeal in the UK, different judges had different interpretation. So I have to clarify that. So thank you, Mr. Dennis Kwok, for striving for this for the accountancy profession. Perhaps Mr. Leong can assist us. The Deputy Secretary said that uh, we can handle this under a mechanism in CDTAs. Well, Dennis Kwok's question was actually asked by me. I asked whether the Law Society has accepted their view. 
there may be gray areas. The IRD and the taxpayer concerned may have different views. In particular, Mr. Dennis Kwok mentioned the latest judgment of the Court of Appeal, which has widened the coverage. I just heard from the Deputy Secretary that there's now a mechanism for handling CDTA. I asked whether the Law Society had accepted the reply from the administration because the administration only finished this paper during the weekend. So does the Law Society accept the answer? The Law Society members are the frontliners, so we should treasure their views. That's what I meant. That's why I spent some time to discuss with the chairman. If we are to proceed with clause-by-clause -clause scrutiny today and we finish our scrutiny work and the Law Society comes back to say that the CDTA mechanism cannot handle the complicated situation, then what will happen? Well, maybe you'll take the remaining 23 minutes to finish the scrutiny work. And if possible, we will convene again in the next few days and ask the Law Society to come back in three days' time. Well, Mr. Alan Leung, this meeting will last till 6 p.m. Bureau, would you please ask the major professional bodies whether or not they have any final comments? We hope that before the 7th of June, we'll be able to obtain their reply through email or other avenues. It's better to do it by way of emails. It's, be it's quicker. Professional privilege is more important. If today we complete clause by clause scrutiny and we don't receive any further comments, we don't need another meeting on the 7th of June. If there are major issues to resolve, the clerk will inform you to attend a short meeting on the 7th of June. So, is that all right for you? So, we formally proceed to clause by clause scrutiny. So, I'll hand over the floor to Brian. I hope that we can scrutinize both the English and Chinese versions at the same time. Deputy Secretary, can you roughly take us through this, or Deputy Commissioner? Yes, Mr. Chairman, the purpose of the Inland Revenue Amendment Bill is to amend Cap 112, the Inland Revenue Ordinance, and Cap 122 subsidiary legislation. The purpose of the amendment is to further enhance the provisions. so that we can collect information and disclose them in future. The bill is divided into three parts, part one, part two, and part three. Part one is basically an introduction. Part two involves the amendments to the Inland Revenue Department, and part three is related to the amendments to Inland Revenue Disclosure of Information Rules. Members. I don't think there's any problem with the structure of the bill. So I'll ask the Deputy Commissioner to proceed with clause by clause scrutiny. Part one, clause one, short title. This ordinance may be cited as the Inland Revenue Amendment Ordinance 2013. Clause two, the enactments specified in parts two and three are amended as set out in those parts. Deputy Commissioner, the amendments in Part 2 and Part 3 will be embedded in the IRO, right? No new parts. Is in the principal ordinance of the IRO, as well as the Inland Revenue Disclosure of Information Rules. There won't be any new piece of in new piece of legislation. Members, any questions on part one of the bill? All right, please continue. Chairman, I now proceed to part two of the bill. 
Amendments to Inland Revenue Ordinance. Clause 3 provides for the heading for Part 8. The original heading is Double Taxation Relief. Now we'll add and exchange of information that is related to future arrangements for EOI. Clause 4. For just a moment, would you please give us more time? It's actually part eight of the principal ordinance. I'm looking at the Chinese version for the heading of section 49. It's double taxation arrangements at the moment. After amendment, well, Mr. Chairman, I'm talking about the heading of part eight. At present, it's double taxation relief. Now, in this amendment bill, in clause 3, we propose to add after that heading and exchange of information. So it will become double taxation relief and exchange of information. Right. No problem. Please continue. Clause 4 of the bill proposes to amend section 49 of the ordinance. That is the small heading, double taxation arrangements, which will be re repealed and to be substituted by arrangements for relief from double taxation and exchange of information. That means the word arrangements will be put at the end. Uh, Legal advice, sir. Arrangements for relief from double taxation and exchange of information. That is my question related to Section 49. The word arrangements apply to both. Well, Mr. Chairman, my understanding is that the word arrangements apply to both concepts relief from double taxation and exchange of information. That means arrangements for relief from double taxation and arrangements for exchange of information. Well, that's what the English version states. There are two different concepts here. That's my understanding. Other members, any more questions? Please continue. Clause 4, bracket 2 of the bill proposes that a certain part of Section 49-1A should be repealed. That is, Hong Kong with a view to affording relief from double taxation in relation to income tax and any tax of a similar character imposed by the laws of that territory. These words will be deleted and then in section 491A, a 1B be added. 1B is like this, but only arrangements made for either or both of the following purposes may be specif specified in an order under subsection 1A. A, affording relief from double taxation. B, exchanging information in relation to any tax imposed by the laws of Hong Kong or the territory concerned. Here, Mr. Chairman, I'd like members to note that the words repealed under subclause 2 is related to income tax, which will not appear again in 1B. That means in terms of tax type, we have really relaxed this. And then in 1B, we retain double taxation relief. And then in B, we add in <coughs> affording relief from double taxation, exchanging information in relation to any tax imposed by the laws of Hong Kong or the territory concerned. Under 
B, uh, first of all, you are affording relief from taxation, and B, exchange information in relation to any tax imposed by the laws of Hong Kong. In your explanation just now, regarding the framework for the exchange of tax information, I, I, I understand that this is necessary because uh, uh, when in the new tier arrangement, you stipulate the types of tax involved. If we're talking about affording relief from double taxation, are we expanding the scope, Chairman? Oh, I don't think that scenario would arise. In Hong Kong, we only charge uh, income tax, salaries tax and property tax. So we, there wouldn't be any incidence of double taxation for property tax. Under the existing tax laws in Hong Kong, re, there are only two, type, two, two types of relief from double taxation. That is profits tax. I mean, you, there may be relief uh, from double taxation for profits tax and salaries tax. So your advice is that even if literally 1B suggests the possibility that it would expand the scope for the relief from double taxation, other than uh, uh, income tax and uh, profit tax, the base major taxes would be stamp duties and properties tax. I think the stamp duty. I think it's not very likely that the, 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 the stamp duty will be subject to double taxation, and it's not covered by the OECD model. My my only worry is would be property tax. After you've expanded the scope here, and because Hong Kong is forced to sign this agreement, then we will be collecting less property tax than before. According to the uh, agreement, uh, I think immovable uh, property, if it's located in Hong Kong, then the power to impose taxation will belong to Hong Kong. So is that the, uh, the approach in all comprehensive tax agreements? Yes. Suppose the other jurisdiction uh, charges tax globally. Property tax paid in Hong Kong then then the the res the, the residents in the other jurisdiction will get relief from double taxation so we have the right to uh, impose property tax under the CDTA model but if the other secretary jurisdiction is a uh, global taxation uh, uh, jurisdiction so we've uh, uh, charged the person property tax. Uh, are you sure that this person will enjoy an exemption? I think the model stipulates that the uh, the country where the taxpayer is domiciled will have to provide uh, relief from double taxation. Very often, they say that if uh, jurisdiction A has the primary taxation right, but jurisdiction B may, may also want to charge the same tax. Can you reassure me that this scenario will not arise? Chairman, if I may use the example of a Hong Kong resident. So let's say he has an immovable property in Hong Kong. Hong Kong has the right to charge tax on this person, and overseas jurisdiction uh, will not have that right because uh, uh, they wouldn't have the authority to impose, uh, pr uh, you know, such a tax on this person. Suppose the owner of this property is a domicile of an, another jurisdiction. Then, in respect of the immovable property located in Hong Kong, we still in Hong Kong has the authority to charge property tax. But since he is also the resident of another tax jurisdiction. The government of that tax jurisdiction will, pursuant to the agreement, 
provide relief from double taxation in respect of Hong Kong's property tax. Well, this is in the model. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from members? Uh, Deputy Secretary. Clause 5 amends uh, Section 51. Uh, bracket 1. Section 51.4a. After possession at all control. In subsection 2. Section 51.4a. Bracket 1. We add all control after the word possession. We are proposing this amendment because the standard of the OECD uh, sets uh, possession or control. The present amendment will now make our legislation consistent with the standard of the OECD. We note that there are certain tax jurisdictions which uh, they only have, which only have the word uh, uh, possession and not control in their legislation, and the OECD has pointed out to this inadequacy. And in this regard, in Hong Kong, we are proposing to add the word or control so that we can satisfy the international standard. See you, see Wing? If you add the word control, will this be inconsistent with uh, uh, the uh, our other, legis uh, our other provisions in Hong Kong? Would you need to amend the other legislation? Well, I'd like to say that un we're not proposing these amendments under the bill, but in respect of the taxpayer or any third party and so on, uh, for the under the I IRO, we have not imposed any new provisions. In other words, for taxpayers or third parties, even though uh, 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 the tax in our provision will need to be consistent with the OECD model, so that when the IOD asks for certain information, uh, the scope could be broadened. But we, this will not directly affect any third parties or taxpayers' uh, uh, responsibility regarding the 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 uh, the, the, the uh, recording of information. Well, in future, if there should be any commercial documents, normally we are used to the word possession. Now that the word control is added, will this uh, have any impact on, on, on litigation, for example, in the future? Uh, Deputy Secretary. We're now using the word possession. It, 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 in moving this amendment, we've looked at other provisions in other pieces of legislation. We've also found examples in other legislation where uh, the concept of possession or control are, is used. So in making this amendment, we will make our ordinance more consistent with the OECD model. And we are not expanding the, 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 the authority or the power uh, 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 given under the law. Regarding possession of control, the ILD and the Bureau claims that we need to satisfy international standards, so you've amended the domestic law. So that even for the ILD to, to enforce the, the, our own IRO, Possession or control would apply to all taxpayers. It's not just about exchange of information. If the IRD wants to ask for information regarding salaries tax and profits tax, we're not just talking about possession. If you have asked somebody to store such information for you, uh, it's not in your possession, but you are able to, you are in control of the information and ask the person to handle such information, then that person will have to supply the information to the IRD. Well, the simple answer is yes. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you said that under other legislation in Hong Kong, uh, the, the term possession or control is also used. Could you give us some examples? 
Well, we've actually, you know, checked. Well, I can immediately give you one example. Under the High Court rules regarding discovery inspection, Order 14, they also use the word possession, custody, or power. Possession or control are not new concepts in the laws of Hong Kong. It just so happens that under the IRO, uh, it, only, it only contained the word possession. So we now need to say, you know, uh, comply with the international standard and therefore we are adding the word control. Any further questions from members? If not, uh, please move on. I'm now up to Section 6, uh, which amends Section 51B. Under 51BAA, we propose to add uh, uh, tax concern or any other sums or values in respect of which a person is chargeable to the tax concern. The reason is that uh, uh, in other jurisdictions, taxes are not calculated in terms of income or profit. It could be calculated on, on according to the value of the product or merchandise. And hence, we have to add, uh, you know, uh, any other sums or values. So we have uh, introduced this concept here. Uh, Deputy Secretary, I still don't understand why you do need to add this, because tax concern already is very broad in scope. I don't know why you still need to add uh, uh, the substitute do that with the, with the more with, with what you're proposing to add to the bill, Chairman. For example, if a particular tax is based on the value of the product, it's 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 it based it's charge it's ba based on the value of a of the product, then we cannot use the term profit or income, and therefore we must add you know, other sums or values to calculate the value. Uh, because of this change, uh, my understanding is that you've broadened the, the scope or the different types of taxes which will be covered. Very often taxes in other jurisdictions, uh, uh, that such taxes are uh, calculated uh, according to the value of, of, of the product. If you say it's, so, it's not broad enough. If, we, if it's only with reference to the person's uh, income or profit, so this may not have a direct relationship with the domestic IRO. I think you're correct, Chairman. It's to you. I think this time we are. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to sign an agreement with the Secretary uh, of the OECD. But uh, is it possible that we do not, you know, add this part to, to uh, uh, amend this section by adding this, the, 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 this uh, uh, provision? I think the tax concern, I think, is already okay operationally, although you know that some countries have certain types of taxes which are rather unique. And if we don't include them, if we don't include them, we can put the mind of those from the business sector at ease. If we include them, it's more convenient for you to implement the tier agreement. Could you further explain this point? Thank you, Chairman and Mr. Liu, Yu, for your question. First of all, uh, we are proposing to amend subsection 1AA. Uh, this only applies to the exchange of information. So regarding the enforcement and assessment by the local uh, tax authorities, uh, it's not relevant. Uh, by adding these words to the provision, this is simply to uh, 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 complement the empowering provision, so which can then cover uh, more types of taxes. And I must emphasize the IRD has to act in accordance with the law, and they have to act according to the legal provisions. By adding this expression, it will become clearer in terms of EOI. 
That is, if certain tax types are to be covered, clear powers will be given to them. So I'm of the view that uh, there is a significance in putting this expression here because they cannot have any power that is not cited in the law. Mr. Yu Siwei. Perhaps international practices require such an expression or provision, but if it is it a hard and fast rule to include such a provision? Otherwise, we can just resort to practice. Can we just delete this expression? Because it's not just as simple as EOI. In future, when there is a litigation or if the IRD prosecutes any institution for breaching this provision, then the party concerned may be convicted. In future, this depends on whether or not a company submits comprehensive information on proceeds. Well, this is about domestic provisions, not EOI. You just say that 1AA only applies to EOI. I can't see how this expression can restrict EOI under I under 1AA. If you want to obtain a search warrant, even if you're talking about local tax types, this expression will es expand your powers. Will that be the case, Deputy Secretary? Mr. Chairman, this expression is to echo the expansion of tax types when it comes to the concrete provisions will use a concrete list to set out the tax types concerned. So when the IRD exercises this power, in fact, this is an enabling provision for a particular tax jurisdiction will set out very clearly which tax types can allow the IRD to get involved in EOI. So members can rest assured about that. Will it uh, be helpful to the DOJ by having this clear expression? Mr. Chairman, for the proposed amendment in Clause 6, it is just to allow the SARG to, in accordance with a request for information, handle a case involving tax types that exist in overseas jurisdictions only. Now, to put it briefly, what do I mean? The legal framework for storing information will not change at all. That means Hong Kong does not have uh, to retain any records in relation to tax types in other jurisdictions. Mr. Yu Si Wing, I'm still worried. I'm not familiar with this. From the legal point of view, is it uh, as what the IRD has explained? Perhaps I should rephrase my question. Just now, the IRD and the Deputy Secretary said that this expression, tax concerned or any other sums or values in respect of which a person is chargeable to the tax concerned, will only apply to the execution of EOI provisions in relation to the tax types listed. Other members and I are worried that this expression may be used to collect information about profits tax property tax, or even salaries tax, and other relevant information. Originally, such information need not be retained by a Hong Kong taxpayer. But as a result of uh, this additional expression, a taxpayer who has to pay salaries tax, property tax, and profits tax may have to retain more information. 
than at present. Mr. Yu Si Wing, have I understood your question correctly? Yes. Perhaps we should reiterate our legislative intent. By adding this expression, well, members should note that this section is about EOI 1AA. We just mentioned the IRD inquiring different parties for information and for retaining the information. So previously, we propose adding the word control, but here you don't have the word control. So this expression only applies to 1A, A, A and B in relation to EOI agreements. In future, when we formulate EOI agreements, that is TIEAs, we'll make sure that when the IRD has to exchange information with other jurisdictions, if other tax types are concerned, then they can have clearer powers. Have I provided a concise answer to you, IRD? For 51B1AA, it actually applies only to those with tax arrangements and tax agreements in relation to exchange of information and the tax types therein. It's not related to the tax types of Hong Kong. Thank you. Well, if you look at 51B, it is power to obtain search warrant. 1B is basically about local tax types, and 1AA is specifically to cover tax types under TIEAs. Mr. Yu Si Wing, what's your interpretation of the expression here? After listening to the explanation from the IRD and the Deputy Secretary, if an enterprise has certain information but has not provided the information or it has not retained the information. So after adding this expression, the enterprise will have to keep the information, right? It will be problematic for it to discard the information. Deputy Secretary. If a taxpayer or a third party has to keep records, we have 51C and D and 51.4. Now, those provisions have not been changed. So here, we've not added any limitation or provisions. If a taxpayer does not have the information, he can tell the IRD that he is not in possession of the information. That's one of the grounds for believing him. Then the IRD will not impose on him any statutory provisions, limitation or penalty. Mr. Yu Wing, if the overseas signatory requests for the information saying that we have kept the information, then what will happen if we can't provide the information? Will the taxpayer concerned be breaching overseas laws or Hong Kong laws? Mr. Yu Si Wing, I think your question is, if the IRD subjectively says that the taxpayer has the information, is that what you mean? Well, because the IRD has to submit the information to an overseas signatory. Maybe the taxpayer has invested overseas. Then the overseas jurisdiction says that uh, the Hong Kong taxpayer should have uh, the information. Then there may be a conflict. Deputy Secretary, perhaps I can answer Mr. Yu Si Wing's question di more directly. First of all, the IRD will not enforce the law on behalf of overseas jurisdictions. So if a taxpayer says that he does not have the information and cannot submit it, then the IRD will only observe uh, the local laws. That is in relation to 51 C and D and 51 4. That is, uh, no extra information will be required. 
After adding this expression, tax concerned or any other sums or values in respect of which a person is chargeable to the tax concerned, that is, there's no additional requirements. It's only under EOI that the IRD can ask the taxpayer more questions, but will not ask local taxpayers to keep information that exceeds the REM provided by local laws. Mr. UC Wing, do you understand? Well, a little bit. If the taxpayer has not kept the information, the Bureau was telling us uh, that the existing provisions for keeping records has not been changed. So if there's information related to tax concerned or any other sums or values, blah, 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 and the taxpayer is not providing the information, then a search warrant can be obtained under 1A A and B here. So if you feel that the taxpayer does possess certain information but is unwilling to furnish that information to you, then you may apply for a search warrant. Application for a search warrant is under strict limitations. That is 51B. If we want to apply a research warrant, a directorate staff will have to provide an affidavit to the magistrate. The magistrate will read the affidavit first before considering the grant of a search warrant. I have to point out that the procedure is very strict. The IRD must have sufficient justifications to support its claim that the taxpayer does possess the information on overseas tax. All right, I can understand the procedure. But can you provide us with more information? CDTA on EOI have been in place for quite some years. Have you ever applied for any search warrant? No, Mr. Chairman. Well, let me cite a case as an example. If you apply to the magistrate for a search warrant and the application is granted and you discover that the person is in possession of these information, Will that person be committing any offence under the IRO? All right, under the search warrant, you've got the information. Will that person be criminally liable? Mr. Chairman, if the person who possesses the information claims before the incident that he does not possess the information and later is discovered that he does possess the information, then he will be breaching the IRO. Just now you said that this expression will not expand the power at present. It's just that you, after adding this expression, you have the power to apply for a search warrant. But the information is for the purpose of EOI. It's not the information that the person has to keep. So where comes the criminal liability? Mr. Chairman, we have to emphasize that at present, for the IRD or any other third party, this expression will not expand any existing provisions. If the taxpayer points out that he does not possess the information, and not just that as a claim, the IRD will accept that as a defense. If in the extreme situation that a search warrant is to be applied for, they still have to go to the court and the court will examine what justifications the IRD has in assessing that that taxpayer does have the information. So 
It's only when a search warrant is granted that criminal liability may result. So first of all, this additional expression will not enlarge the or expand the existing powers. Even with this expression, the IRD will only be given more flexibility for search warrants and criminal liability. All these will have to go through very stringent court proceedings. And the IRD must have very strong reasons for the court. You asked whether there would be criminal liabilities. Well, in my answer just now, I said that if the person claimed uh, earlier that he did not possess such information and subsequently we found out that he was making a false statement, then he might be in breach of a criminal offence. It's not just a question of the information obtained after we've, uh, uh, you know, obtained the warrant. Uh, he would be criminally liable if he made a false statement. Does it, regarding the, the false statement, is that based on your authority to ask for information under the, uh, the provisions of the IRO, right? Every time the IRD requests for certain information, we Act pursuant to 51 bracket 4 of the IRO. If the person claims he didn't have such information earlier, and subsequently we found out that he has, then I believe he would have to be criminally liable. Well, members and myself have certain areas of concern, especially in respect of Section 6. Could the Bureau and the IRD, you know, draft a paper? to explain to us why you need to uh, propose this amendment. And secondly, the Deputy Secretary told us that 51B1AA will only apply to uh, the exchange of information. And thirdly, the Deputy Secretary told us uh, under what circumstances would a criminal liability arise? Uh, we hope that with that explained, we can put on record that in future, uh, when we need to invoke 51B bracket 1AA, we would have on record that this is your your legislative intent, and that has been put on record. When can you give give that to us? We can certainly you know, have it ready before the next meeting. Please do so as soon as possible, within one or two days. Mr. Yu, do you have any further questions? Okay. <coughs> so I think we had a, have had a detailed discussion of Section 6. So, Deputy Secretary, can you move on? Yes, we're now on to Section 7, which amends uh, Section 52 of the IRO. That is, after the word possession, we add all control. Uh, Fifty section is uh, applies to uh, information that is required to be provided by uh, the person concerned. We now come to part three of the bill, which is about disclosure of information. Uh, section eight. Uh, uh, amend Section 4, actually. Repeal does not relate to any period before the relevant arrangements came into operation. And substitute relates to the f uh, the following. And that is the carrying out of the provisions of the relevant arrangements in respect of any period that starts after the arrangement have come into operation or b the administration or enforcement of the tax law of the requesting government's territory in respect of any period that starts after the relevant arrangements have come into operation chairman we can see that the there are two points regarding this amendment first of all it only applies to any period that starts after the arrangements have come into effect. And A says that it would only apply to the provisions 
uh, in the arrangement, including the CDTA and any tax interest included uh, that would come under A. B involves uh, foreign tax jurisdictions and the, and the, and the provisions therein. And based, still, it is also, uh, it will only be in respect of any period that starts after the relevant arrangements have come into operation. In other words, there is no retrospective effect. Chair, uh, Commissioner, I don't quite understand why you need to split it up into A and B. Chairman, A is about the CDTA. Uh, the provisions under the CDTA, that is, any tax benefits uh, uh, would be covered by A because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's about the carrying out of the provisions under the arrange uh, arrangement. B is a, in respect of the tax legislation in the ov overseas jurisdiction. Chairman, under 4B, we want to, you know, stick to the original legislative intent. That is, uh, that any period after the implementation of the arrangement, for any overseas tax jurisdictions, when they enforce any of the tax legislation or when they need to make assessments, then the then we have to uh, uh, well, the wordings that we've used here are taken out of the OECD model, actually. Thank you. Perhaps uh, we can, you know, uh, allow some time for members and myself to go through this first of all. Commissioner, I would also like to ask a few technical questions. For A, you've used the word arrangement twice, and in B, again, the word arrangement is used. But you said that in A, it's basically, you know, you know, based on the CDTA arrangement. Chairman. In the English text of the bill, we use the plural form of arrangements. In, in the Chinese version, we use the word non pi. The words that we see are the provisions of the relevant arrangements, which could include the CDTA and tier as well. Technically, yes. But for tier alone, it's not for any other purpose except for the exchange of information. So, provisions of the relevant arrangements refer to these relevant provisions under the CDTA arrange, uh, agreement. Uh, Commissioner, perhaps you, should, you, should, you could perhaps give us some time to pause here and, and reflect upon this.
有同事揾間陳建波，揾間打俾 Dennis， 打佢可能會聽，<笑>開緊隔離後城。得啦，而家。啊，唔该晒局长，我谂。Thank you, Commissioner. Have these、uh, words been taken out of the CTTA model text? Could you give us a paper? Because I want to put on record that is、uh, when we enforce this、uh, piece of legislation. Although under the common law, we shouldn't. Uh, if the provisions are clear enough, we shouldn't you know, refer to the legislative intent. But if there are taxpayers or legal petitioners, if should there be any ambiguities, they may need to,、uh, you know,、uh, you know, refer to the explanation which you give us, give to this bill's committee. So why do you need to divide section four into two legs? Could you give us a paper? Deputy Secretary, perhaps we can now move on with the clause by clause. 草案嘅第九条啦，第九。We now are on to section nine, which is about the schedule regarding the、uh, disclosure information, and this schedule is about、uh, the the safeguards. Again, we propose to add all control after possession. The purpose is consistent with the what is in the principal legislation. We just want to make it consistent with the principal legislation. So you're proposing to add or control after items five and six、uh, in the schedule. Any questions? I have nothing further to 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 add, Chairman. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Technically, we have scrutinised all provisions. Of the Inland Revenue Amendment Bill 2013, but the administration has promised another paper for us and further explanation on a rather significant issue that is LPP legal professional privilege. In particular, they have to go back and ask the Law Society for any further feedback. So. Technically, we've provisionally completed the scrutiny of the bill. Yet, I don't think we've completed the work of the bills committee. So, on the morning of the seventh of June, we'll continue with our scrutiny work. Maybe on Thursday afternoon, I'll reconsider. Whether or not we still need the meeting on the seventh of June. Anyway, I'd like to ask members and the administration to keep that time slot open. That is available. Anyway, I'd like the administration to go back, in particular, to ask the law, ask the law society for any further feedback. Members, any further comments? Legal advisor and administration, any further comments? No. So. The